Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Ed Whisper. I'm really excited about talking to you guys today. I did an interview earlier today with Dr. Julie Lamb, and she's one of my dearest friends, also a fertility doctor with PNWF in Seattle. And we were just talking about her new book. Her new book is The Fertility Expert's Guide to Egg Freezing, Everything You Need to Know About Putting Your Fertility on Ice. And you guys already know my saying, it's always nice to have eggs on ice. It's already nice to, always nice to have embryos on ice. And now she has a book called Everything You Need to Know About Putting Your Fertility on Ice. And then we were talking and we were laughing and she said something that I was like, oh my God, that's really funny. And she said, wouldn't it be great if women could just ejaculate eggs? So I can't take credit for that, but you guys, wouldn't it be great <laughs> if we could just ejaculate eggs? Like literally, like why can't we invent that? Why does there have to be such a fertility gender gap that we have to go through so much and guys just can ejaculate sperm? Like, don't you think that's unfair? So then I was thinking maybe for April Fools, if you guys don't know, every year I do, I'm telling you already, anything you see on April 1st is not real. But I was like, hmm, wouldn't that be a fun April Fools thing? First woman to ejaculate eggs. <laughs> Study shows that women can now do that. And here's how. So one day, <laughs> probably not though. So thank you guys for joining me to Ask the Egg Whisper. If you're joining for the first time and you have a question that you want me to answer, just go to asktheegwhisperer.com. Super simple. You just put in your question in there. My producer, Paula, my producer, Paula, will basically email you, literally, she'll email you when your question is going to be answered. And if you miss the live run of the show, no worries. She'll send you another email after it airs so that you can watch the clip later. Okay, so let's get started. This first question is from CJ and CJ is saying, I'm 37 years old. My AMH is five, FSH is 7.6. My prolactin is normal. I got pregnant within the first three months of trying. Unfortunately, I had a miscarriage at eight weeks. I had a DNC and the pregnancy tissue tested chromosomally normal, but now I've been trying for 13 months. I've been through everything, all the angel method tests. And for those of you guys who don't know what that is, you can go to angelmethod.com. I did them all. I have low positive ANA. I have an indeterminate anti-cardiolipin antibody, but they're all really low. My day 21 progesterone was good. Thyroid was good. HSG clear, carrier screening clear. Recurrent pregnancy loss panel with clotting disorders good. Ovulating regularly every 28 days tracked with a BBT. My periods are very light though. Not a new thing post DNC. Only one and a half days with two teaspoons of blood, often brown and small clots. My OB doesn't think this is an issue and calls me lucky. I'm trying baby aspirin and vitamin E this month, but I've tried baby aspirin in the past. Does a light period mean a thin lining? Any thoughts? So CJ, listen to your gut. Your uterus is telling you a story. Listen to your uterus. Your uterus is saying, pay attention to me. And you're actually listening and you're reaching out to me here on Ask the Egg Whisper to ask for advice. Remember, this show and what I talk about is just for educational purposes, information, informational purposes, not in the place of medical advice from your personal physician. So I'll always tell you what I would do if you were a patient of mine. So if you were a patient of mine, I would say, this sounds like we're dealing with possibly Asherman syndrome. So Asherman syndrome is when your lining gets really thin. Risk factor for Asherman syndrome is a DNC procedure. And I know you had a DNC procedure. You also shared with me that even before the DNC, maybe your lining was a little light. So maybe there was some sort of exposure to something, maybe an IUD or an infection or something that could have caused the lining to be thin even before the DNC. But it is not normal. And I'm sorry that your OBGYN said that you were lucky to have such a light period. And of course, I totally know what they, what they meant. They were just trying to be positive and, and try and paint a more positive picture around it. But at the end of the day, it's very possible that the thin lining is interfering with a healthy implantation and might increase your risk of having implantation issues and a miscarriage. So you guys all know my egg whisper golden rule. If you're 37 years old, think about freezing embryos for yourself while you still have healthy eggs. And it sounds like you do. That pregnancy taught us a lesson. And the lesson is that you make chromosomally normal pregnancies. And I hope that continues to be the case, especially with your AMH that's five and your FSH that's normal. This is an opportunity for you to think about your future family and then talk to a fertility doctor or your OBGYN as well about doing a cavity evaluation through a procedure like an HSG or hysteroscopy to see what's going on, to see if there's any scar tissue there that can be removed. So that's what I would suggest for you is 
talk to someone about what's my diagnosis, and it sounds like you've done a lot of testing, but go through all the possible reasons why you might be having an issue, then design your treatment protocol based on that diagnosis and talk about what the prognosis is for you, talk about that treatment that you've decided on and what the chances are gonna be with that treatment, and then go do it. So I hope this helps you, CJ. Next question is from Amber, and Amber says, Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 30 years old and I carry a fragile X. I have 93 repeats. We conceived our daughter almost four years ago, naturally, within a matter of one month of trying. It was during my pregnancy that I found out that I was a carrier of fragile X. I have no other history of pregnancy or miscarriage. Fast forward to now, and we're ready to add another healthy baby to our family. We've had two IVF cycles which were canceled within a week of STEM due to poor response. My AMH when we last checked is well below 0 0.1, so not ideal for my age, but this is caused by fragile X, which can cause premature ovarian failure. Both IVF cycles had different protocols. I'm wondering if there's something we're missing or not doing right. I take CoQ10, vitamins E and D, along with my prenatal. In my most recent cycle, I was prescribed Menopure, Falstam, Omnitrope, and Lupron for stimming. Should we consider cycle number three? Thank you so much. So Amber, I am so glad that you have your daughter from four years ago, and you're right. That's exactly what having fragile X, especially 93 repeats, can cause. It can cause early menopause, and it's so incredibly unfair. So you guys remember, diagnosis before treatment. If someone were to show up and say, I have an AMH of 0 0.1 at 30 years of age, you guys know that I always say, make sure you've done enough genetic screening. Do a carrier screen. Do a chromosome analysis, and you know the answer. So knowing the answer, what I would say is that it's really hard to overcome this. I wish that I could say there's something I could do differently to help you grow eggs once this has happened. But I think if you feel ready to do another third cycle and consider other options as far as stimulation approaches, I just know that eggs, I think of them as little waves in the ocean and sometimes you can catch a better wave and maybe catch a wave where you might have three follicles and see if that's even possible given your AMH of 0 0.1. So talk to your doctor about doing a mid luteal phase stim, no birth control pills, a mild or mini IVF cycle. Talk to them about adding HGH and the egg quality supplements that I always talk about. But I think now might be a good time to talk about what would we do if this third cycle didn't work and maybe talk about creative family building options. This is just totally not your fault. And if you have a family member like a sister or someone else that would consider donating eggs to you, that's also a good thing to start talking about as well. But I would talk to a therapist because this is really, really heavy stuff and it sounds like you know a lot about what's going on and just kind of go through the decision tree between you and your husband and figure out what feels right for you guys. Okay, this next question is from Nilu, and Nilu says, how mandatory is a COVID vaccine for someone who's in their IVF journey? Can the virus ca cause harm to a fetus, not a fetus, a fetus if someone who is pregnant gets COVID? So the answer is it's, it's not mandatory at all for people who, do, who, who are doing IVF to get a vaccine. Um, I actually make it mandatory for my staff to get it believe it or not, in order to work for me and my staff is like, do I still have a job? I'm like, did you get the vaccine? Because <laughs> I want to keep my patients safe. I don't ever want there to be a situation where a patient comes in, I have a staff member that has COVID and now I have to call all the patients that were seen that day because of some sort of COVID exposure that was the fault of my staff. And you know what I mean? It's no one's fault. So the answer is we can't mandate the COVID vaccine for IVF patients. The only thing we can mandate is that you wear a mask when you come in covering your nose and you don't come in if you have a fever, or if you've had any COVID contacts. I do recommend the COVID vaccine to every single one of my patients and I'm like, get it as soon as possible, please. And it's because the virus can harm a fetus. It seems like the COVID complication rate might go up as much as six times if you are pregnant. Having a respiratory illness in pregnancy is never good for mother or baby. So please, if you are considering a pregnancy in the near future, whether you're trying to conceive right now or already pregnant, consider getting the COVID vaccine. This next question comes from Jessica and Jessica says, hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for sharing your knowledge with the world. I'm 34 years old and just was diagnosed with the DOR. So DOR stands for decreased ovarian reserve and I'm recovering from restricting my calories for many years. I'm just with a normal weight range for my height, but I'm wondering if my AMH level could be off as a test was done when my body was still in a state of stress from not enough calories. I was still getting my period, but they were very light and I was losing weight and not sleeping well. Is there any chance my AMH could be slightly different after six to 12 months of eating well and gaining weight? I couldn't find any studies which looked into low weight, poor diet and fertility or AMH levels, thank you. 
So Jessica, what I tell people is your fertility isn't skin deep. Egg loss can happen, however, under situations of extreme stress. I have seen patients, let's say, who have an AMH of 0.5, and then like a year and a half later, the AMH level is like 1.6, and the follicle count when it was 0.5 was certainly 5, and then a year later, the follicle count is higher. So those things can happen, but I would say since you're 34 years old, if you have the opportunity to freeze eggs now while you can, I would do that rather than waiting to see if the egg count will go higher later. I don't think you'll have any fertility regret if you choose to do an egg freezing procedure now. This next question comes from Abby. Abby says, my mother and my grandma, my mother's mother, both went through premature menopause. My mom started menopause at age 34. What are the odds that I'll go through the same thing? I'm 29 and trying to get an idea of how much time I have left to try and conceive. We just started last month. How long should we try before going to the doctor or testing our fertility? Abby, you came to the right doctor. I feel like everyone should get a tushy check before they even start conceiving their first baby. Get some levels checked. Get your uh, AMH, your FSH, estradiol. Do a pelvic ultrasound. Do carrier screening. I wonder why your mom went through early menopause. The last um, question that we had about two questions ago was someone sharing about early menopause and having the fragile X mutation and finding that out in pregnancy. So my goal for every single patient is to learn as much there is that you can learn about you before pregnancy, so then you feel well prepared for the journey ahead. And the journey ahead would be the family size that you want. Of course, this is just about planning and preparing. And of course, when you plan and prepare, sometimes things happen that are out of our control, like miscarriages and having a little bit more of a struggle. But I feel like, especially in young women who are so lucky to have that information from their mother, it's important to get your levels checked. Your fertility is not going to be your mother's fertility. However, a majority of the genes that we inherit do come from our mother related to when we go through menopause. So I think especially if you want more than one baby, this is the perfect time to get your fertility levels checked. And um, I recommend that to everyone. But I, one of my, you guys constantly hear me talk about my golden rules, but one of my golden rules is if you're 21 and your mother went through early menopause, get your levels checked by the time you're 21. If your mother has not gone through early menopause, then you can wait until you're maybe around 25. So at 29, I certainly want you to learn more about your body. It's not about fear mongering or make you feel worried unnecessarily. It's that saying that you guys have all heard of, which is knowledge is power. You don't want to look back with fertility regret and say like, how come I didn't get my levels checked and freeze eggs while I still had them? And then now since you're partnered, you would say, why not use technology to freeze embryos for the future for your future family? So this next question comes from Jamie. And Jamie says, what vitamins do you recommend for egg quality and quantity? I have a low AMH and decreased ovarian reserve. Currently, I'm taking a preconception multivitamin, DHEA, CoQ10, melatonin, calcium, all from Theralogix, and I'm going to be adding acai berry. Also, is there a difference between pterostilbene and trunigen? So you just answered the question for me, yes to true niagen, and that's the component, the component that's in there, the active ingredient is NAD, and you don't have to buy it from true niagen. There's so many other companies that basically you know, sell the same thing. So NAD, you can take it in different doses. The 300 milligram dose might give you a lot of side effects, and that includes like tachycardia, feeling a little bit anxious. You can also get their 150 milligram dose, and there are other companies that sell 100 milligrams or lower. So make sure if you're feeling kind of anxious, waking up in the middle of the night, not able to sleep, realize that that could be a side effect of a supplement, believe it or not. And then as far as pterostilbene, if you're taking pterostilbene, I don't necessarily think you need to also take a side berry. However, you know, I don't, I, I don't want you to like waste money on stuff. So maybe finish off the side berry and then replace it with pterostilbene. But there might be some sort of cumulative benefit of taking both together. Um, they might make your eggs sparkle even more if you take them together. I should do like a sparkle uh, drinking game. Every time I take, I say sparkle, everyone has to take a shot of my favorite drink, which is tequila. I need to have my own line of tequila. It's called the sparkling egg tequila. I wish that you could have a shot every single day when I say sparkle. Okay, shots for everybody. Um, this question is from Nikki. And Nikki says, hi, Dr. Amy, I just turned 40. My antral follicle count is 25. My FSH is 4.5 and I've had three failed IVF cycles. I'm sorry, Nikki, that's so unfair. Um, I had a missed miscarriage due to a chromosomal abnormality. My partner and I have been genetically tested and uh, we are totally clear. We're not, we're genetically compatible and don't share any common mutations. 
each IVF cycle, we ret re retrieve less eggs each time, 14, 11, and then eight. All mature eggs fertilize, and they're doing great by day three, but everything changed day five. The first cycle, we didn't PGS test, which resulted in a missed miscarriage due to a mix of chromosomal abnormalities. The second cycle, three got to blast and could be tested, but all three had abnormalities. And the most recent cycle, none were suitable for testing or freezing. A recent ultrasound revealed a single nodule of endometriosis seen within the left uterosacral ligament. Should we have surgery? I'm worried about damaging my reserves. Okay, so here's the deal, Nikki. I swear to God almighty that I was reading your story and I was like, this is an endometriosis story without even telling me you had that nodule of endometriosis. I know it's probably not a surprise that I literally see patients all day. I have a dress hanging. I put it on and I just grab the, the questions that are emailed to me from Paula and I start reading. So there's no preparation that goes into reading these questions. I know, not a surprise. But the answer is it is possible that endometriosis could be affecting your egg quality. It can be de causing a lower number of mature eggs. When I think of endometriosis, I think of it increasing your chronological, I mean, increasing your egg age relative to your chronological age. So it can make your eggs act even older than your chronological age. I hope that makes sense. So another supplement that I would consider having you add if you aren't already on it is N-acetylcysteine since we kind of have an idea what's what's going on. We do know that your age is 40 and it's super normal to have this experience at 40, but at 25 follicles, it's just like, oh, can't we just get one healthy embryo? Is that so hard to ask? So I do think there might be a role in taking a quick timeout, doing a laparoscopy because we know that endometriosis in st some studies has showed that it causes a lower rate of egg maturity. So maybe there could be a benefit in your situation. I do think that you might benefit also from doing a karyotype on you and your husband. Talk to your doctor about that. Since I don't know the whole story about you, see if doing parental chromosome testing makes sense in your situation. Um, talk to your doctor about taking HGH. Do add NAD and terostilbene if you're not all on those already. And the other thing that I would say is that given that we obviously have an issue with blast formation rate, there are different cool ways of doing IVF. And one of them could be, you might benefit from a mid luteal start, just see what your doctor thinks about what you can do to get more mature eggs. So increasing your trigger shot dosing to maybe 10,000, 15, 20,000 with a Lupron trigger, maybe triggering at 37 hours and not 36 hours. So those are all creative ways to deal with the issue of getting less mature eggs, you know, um, based, even though you have a really high number of follicles. Okay, this next question comes from Megan. And Megan is saying, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 30 with a history of severe endometriosis that went undiagnosed and untreated until I ended up in the ER. They discovered a cyst the size of a softball and scheduled laparoscopic surgery. Surgery went ARI and resulted in removal of my ovary. Now, four years later, my husband and I have been trying for a year. His sperm's been tested twice, and although improving, it's still low count in motility. My doctor says I have 11 follicles, but a large fibroid. I've been attempting to track ovulation. have never tested high or peak ovulation. Why? Where do we go next? Thank you. Okay, Megan, let me break it down to you. Endometriosis is a fertility-threatening condition. I already told you guys just like 10 seconds ago that it can make your eggs act older than your chronological age. What does that mean? We got to freeze embryos. Endometriosis can also cause scar tissue. So I got my little pink stuffy here. I was just using it as a little model with a patient a second ago on a video call before I hopped on here. And what endometriosis can do is you can have your ovary stuck here and your tube can be out here, literally. So that egg pickup is going to be really hard for, to, uh, you know what I'm saying? Let me just do another um, little uh, demonstration. Um, good thing I, I think I <laughs> shaved my armpits today. It doesn't happen that often you know, COVID. So let's just say um, this is your ovary. This is this is your tube out there. So your ovaries here, your tubes all the way out here. You can see my jiggly arms. Um, that egg, it's going to be so hard for that egg to get picked up. Whereas if the ovary was right there, right underneath the tube, that tube is just like, hello, come to me. I hope that makes sense. So what I'm trying to describe with my very awkward hand gestures and awkwardness is that 
even if God touches you during surgery, you are at risk of having scar tissue formation that can affect egg pickup. So endometriosis can affect egg quality. Endometriosis can affect um, the tubal motility and movement of that fallopian tube and the embryo transport system. And then you've also shared with us the male factor size. So go to ballsmethod.com and let's get that sperm sparkling. So guys can actually improve their sperm count. Make sure you rule out a varicocele. Look at the sperm DNA fragmentation. Look at his testosterone. Get him on a healthy you know, sperm diet. I do that so that he lifts weights. Um, when he can take supplements, eat healthy, sleep well, decrease stress, the list goes on and on and on. But at the end of the day, it sounds like we need embryo creation to fix the fertilization that is both egg related, sperm related, and tube related. And you won't regret doing that. And then before you transfer, it sounds like you might have a little bit of adenomyosis. Ask your doctor, is there a chance that this fibroid that you're seeing could actually be an adenomyoma? And should I take Depo-Lupron? Should I treat it before I transfer? And let your embryos guide you as far as what you should be doing next. I hope this is helpful. Okay, this next question comes from Sandra. Sandra says, what would you recommend for someone who has recurrent chemical pregnancies? I was diagnosed with PCOS, married for 10 and a half years, 10 plus years, with three failed IVF cycles. Never been pregnant, please help. So Sandra, Thank you for sharing this. And this is experience that a lot of people have. And so in a case like this, I would say you have an issue that could be caused by tubal pathology. So we want to make sure these aren't recurrent ectopic pregnancies. So take a look at the fallopian tubes again. Is this also an endometriosis story? Because it certainly can be. So you might benefit from a hysteroscopy. If let's say there's a cavity issue like a polyp and laparoscopy, you can do them all at the same time. Given everything that you've been through, that might make sense. It could also be due to sperm DNA fragmentation issues. So I would look at that. I would also look at parental karyotypes to so do a chromosome analysis on you and your husband. Um, I don't know, I can't tell your age here, but I feel like based on what you're sharing with me, it sounds like you might be over the age of 35. So um, my thought process would also, if you didn't do IVF with genetic testing, perhaps next time you do IVF with genetic testing and do chromosome testing on the embryos first. Okay, this next question comes from Rebecca. Rebecca says, hi, Dr. Amy. Thank you for taking the time to read my question. I'm 31. I have endometriosis recently, had a laparoscopy and a tubal flush. We've been trying for two years and I have an AMH of 0.66. I recently did an IVF cycle, got seven eggs, six mature, but only one fertilized. And we're currently hoping it grows. My husband has had his sperm checked and it's great, but our egg and sperm do not want to do the dance. The doctor has recommended to start priming with melatonin, testosterone cream, and to use HGH a week before my next stem cycle. I'm taking all the vitamins, including prenatal vitamin D, iron, zinc, and CoQ10. Is there anything else that you would recommend for me? Because as we like to say, no one has ever died from having hope. That is true, Rebecca. Hope never killed anybody. So my thought is this. Have you done sperm DNA fragmentation testing? Have you added Pixie on the day of the egg retrieval? Have you asked your doctor if they've ruled out everything related to sperm that could potentially cause an embryo progression issue and lack of fertilization? Because obviously, I still don't know if that embryo grew. So one fertilized, and now I'm like, what happened? What happened? And obviously, I don't know. But if you're there, Rebecca, if you're listening to us right now and watching me, if you are there and you can live chat, please do tell us if the embryo grew. If not, that's okay. But my thought in a case like yours is I want you to consider another cycle if that's something that you guys would consider. I would do the sperm DNA fragmentation testing. I would start HGH even now in preparation for another cycle and include it twice a week in your cycle. Consider calcium activation of the eggs in a case where you have six mature and one fertilized, it could be obviously an egg quality issue, but you, but there could be something sperm related that we're missing here. And calcium activation is something that I have seen help with fertilization failure. And it's not like you had complete fertilization failure with only one fertilized. It, it obviously feels like that. I'm super happy that you had one fertilized. I would look at your day three FSH again and your AMH. I'm just curious where you're at. And then, um, and that's pretty much, you know, I think your doctor is thinking a lot along the same lines as I am, but I would say at the age of 31, 
I would not stop here, and it sounds like you're not going to, and I would certainly try again. So this next question comes from Chelsea. I'm 34. I've had two kids conceived easily without assistance, and we want a third. After 13 months in an extensive infertility workup, my doctor has diagnosed me with a uterine isthmocele. I'm scheduled for surgery, but pending due to the COVID. We have no idea when surgery will be. Because my AMH is 0.9, my follicle count is 10. We decided to do IVF first to bank, hopefully to embryos. My question is this. Have you ever transferred in patients in it with an isthmocele without repair? Is there a particular protocol for the fluid? And if I do get the repair and it's not su successful, how do you manage those patients? So Chelsea, let me just do a demonstration. <laughs> let me see, hopefully it's a better demonstration than the last one I showed you and did. So um, an isthmocele basically means that where your cesarean scar was, you have a fluid collection in that. So that fluid collection there can be an implantation blocker. Embryos can actually implant in that C-section scar because the fluid's in there. We call that a cesarean ectopic. Cesarean ectopics, very, very bad. The other thing that can happen, you can have implantation inside the uterus and the placenta can actually grow into the cesarean scar defect. Also, very, very bad. The other thing that can happen is the integrity of that incision is not strong and then you can have something called uterine rupture and that is, again, yes, very, very bad. So there are surgeons that are well-known surgeons, and this is the type of surgery that they do, and that's the kind of surgeon that I want you to see. I want you to see someone that's like, I got this. You don't have to worry. This is something that I've seen before, and Chelsea, I got you. And so typically after surgery like this, your chances of having a healthy implantation are going to be really, really good. I have not had a case of a CSD, that's another word for isthmocel, a cesarean scar defect, that has not been successful, meaning I've had patients who had it repaired. Another name for it is niche, N-I-C-H-E. So I feel like as long as you're with a surgeon that has a really, um, has good experience repairing these, you're going to be in good hands. If you're with a surgeon that has never done a surgery like this before, perhaps it would be a good idea to get a second opinion. As far as how do I manage those patients who have a repair and it's not successful, certainly you can try another surgery, but at that point you might want to consider not transferring at all because it could put your life and your baby's life at risk. And my rule, I have lots of rules. So one of them is no mama drama in general, and I don't like drama. Um, and the other rule is we want healthy baby, healthy mom all the time. So in a case where you already have two kids, I certainly don't want anyone to do anything that's going to put their life at risk. And a CSD, especially a large one, can put any woman's life at risk. So I'm acting like Auntie, bossy Auntie Amy here. <laughs> this next question is from Lindsay. Lindsay says, hi, I'm 34 years old. My last AMH was 1.2. AFC ranges from 9 to 11. For people who don't know what all these acronyms, like I'm just rattling off all these letters, like I'm a rap artist, the AMH or the AFC. Um, AMH stands for anti-malarian hormone. It's a hormone secreted by cells that surround the eggs. When your level is high, it means a high number of eggs. When your level is low, it means a low number of eggs. If you have a low number of eggs when you're young, it doesn't mean your eggs are old. It just means that you have a lower number at your age. If you have a lower number when you're older, it means that you're normal because that's normal to have a lower number when you're older. But when you have a lower number when you're younger, that isn't considered um, average and you could run out of healthy eggs sooner. Okay, so what Lindsay is sharing with us is that she has a fall, uh, an AMH of 1.2, and that's consistent with a follicle count around 1.0. And she did share with us that her follicle count is between 9 and 11. This is considered uh, in that uh, uh, average and normal for someone who's 34 years old. She's gearing up for her third egg retrieval, she tells us, and at baseline they discovered a cyst. The darn cyst. You guys, we make cysts every time we ovulate. Sometimes they go completely by the time we're ready for an IVF cycle, and sometimes they stick around, and it's super annoying. So then my third cycle was postponed because of the cyst. On day three, the same darn cyst was seen. My follicle, my FSH was 9, and my estradiol was 146. My doctor was only able to see five follicles at baseline in addition to the cyst. Is it possible the cyst is the reason for my lower than average AFC as well as elevated FSH? Or could this indicate a drop in my reserve? First IVF in September, we had 12 eggs retrieved. Different protocol focused on quality yielded six eggs for a second retrieval in December, but both cycles had a baseline of 11. And the answer, Lindsay, is it is possible that your ovaries are just like, leave me alone right now. Just leave me alone. Whatever's going on, I just need to get through this in my own time. 
and you just have to listen to your ovaries and just wait. Just wait it out and watch for a good wave. And that good wave hopefully will be coming soon because your AMH is 1.2. But another way to figure things out is to repeat your AMH again and see where you're at. If your AMH has dropped to 0.5, it could be a readjustment of what's going on, but unlikely. I feel like at 34, things are just kind of like slowly going down. It's not like all of a sudden you're at a cliff and now you've been pushed off and your AMH is going to be 0.5. That's highly unlikely to occur in such a short period of time. Look at your vitamin D levels. Look at your egg quality supplements. Your FSH of 9 and your elevated estradiol does worry me just a little bit about some, you know, about what's going on, but it doesn't worry me so much because you're only 34 and your follicle count was really high not that long ago. So just keep checking in. I'm like one of those people. I'm a little unusual, right? So I'll see a patient like you. And I'll be like, what are you doing in two weeks? Come and see me. And I'll see you again. And I'll be like, okay, I, I'm not sure that I want to start right now. Let's have you come back in two weeks. And then we're just like, yes, annoyed that, I mean, no one's ever annoyed to have to see me. Maybe a little. Um, and then we really are happy with the decision that we make and the time that we took to finally decide that this is the right wave of eggs to ride. And I, and I feel like there should be a song like riding, I don't know, riding your eggs or some like Beach Boy song that should be playing in the background. I really need a band, I think, during Ask the Egg Whisperer. I need a band, I need a soundtrack, I need a DJ, I need a bar for whenever I say, whenever I say sparkle and you guys take a shot of tequila for me. <laughs> um, Non-alcoholic tequila, of course. Okay, this next question is from Amanda and Amanda says, we originally were told we needed to do IVF because my husband has or had a low sperm count. I was 36 then, now 38, and six IVF cycles uh, with no outcome. Is there something, and I know she doesn't say that, but I say that because that's like, uh, I know if I was the doc, I would be like, uh, and that's how I feel when I'm in that situation. I take my job kind of personally and seriously. Is there something that we're missing? We have done all the tests. Do we move on to a donor egg, switch doctors, at a loss on what to do? Amanda, here's the deal. Diagnosis before treatment. We know you're 36, now you're 38, so we got some age-related stuff going on. But six IVF cycles and no outcomes. You told me that the sperm counts low, so what's up with that? Are we missing a Y chromosome microdeletion? Are we missing a balanced translocation? Are we missing a low testosterone that we can treat? Are we missing a varicose seal? I almost got all those words out without stumbling on them. Are we missing an elevated sperm DNA fragmentation test result? So let's get some more answers. I got a lot of puzzle pieces in this fertility puzzle that are just like empty. And I want to fill them in with all the stuff that I just mentioned to really feel like I have a really good picture. Because I can tell you that I've had cases just like yours where people have gone on to donor egg and the embryos were just the same. And I've even had patients that are like, I don't understand. The embryos with my own eggs were actually better than the embryos with, my, with the donor eggs that we used. So I'm not sure if this is all egg related. It sounds like this could be sperm related. So I had a, a, I had a guy, I know a guy. Um, I had um, a wonderful fertility doctor on not that long ago. And he actually talked about the COVID vaccine. And prior to that, he's had lots of award-winning papers that he's shared with us on the Egg Whisperer show. And he shared one about, and no guy wants to hear about a needle on their balls, but yes, I did just say that. He shared his study that was award-winning about aspiration of sperm leading to a higher blast formation rate and a higher live birth rate. So talk to your doctor about that and see if a procedure like that would be warranted in your case. See a fabulous urologist. There's so many that also subspecialize in fertility and um, they can give you a perspective as well and hopefully do a lot of the tests that are in balls method for you guys too. So I would just get a second opinion, get a third opinion, go back to your doctor, get all the official reports, go to embryodiamonds.com, make that binder, join my IVF class, and let's get to the bottom of it to see what we learn before you move on to an egg donor. Just knowing that you're even saying that just means that you guys all know the saying, you're going to be a mother one way or another, and it's okay if it's not with your own DNA, and your heart won't know the difference if it's someone else's genes. But the reality is... I don't want you to make a mistake and move on to donor egg and then end up in the same situation because that just totally sucks. And that's an understatement. So this next question comes from Hira. Hira says, what are my chances of getting pregnant naturally? My hubby only has 200,000 million sperm cells. So Hera, the chances of getting pregnant naturally with 200 million sperm cells, I'm sorry, 200,000 sperm cells is about zero. That's equivalent to basically having had a vasectomy. 
Could there be a miracle? Absolutely, but I don't want you to be waiting for it. So let's figure out why the sperm count is so low. Go to the balls method. I know, I know. See if there's a varicocele. See if he could benefit from taking clomid or Rimadex, going to lap ACG shots. Get him out of the hot tub in the sauna. Make sure you ruled out all the genetic stuff. Feed him lots of CoQ10, goji berries, blueberries, antioxidants, cranberries, you know what I mean? And then get to the bottom of this and figure out what you guys should be doing next as far as, you know, embryo creation through IVF with ICSI and um, see what you guys learn. And hopefully you guys will be successful. So this next question comes from Mandy. Mandy says, hello, Dr. Amy. I've been doing IVF for four years, four cycles with two different doctors. Current age is IVF. I started, well, current age is IVF as if that's an age. Current age is 41. I started IVF when I was 38. Spouse's age is 45, testing of his sperm, all normal. In July of 2018, my AMH was 1.6. I've never been pregnant. I'm taking Synthroid 125 micrograms. My HSG showed both tubes blocked with scar tissue, not a hydrocell pinks. Option was given to me to either unblock the tubes in the operating room or try IVF. So before I go further, you guys, there's not much you can do with blocked fallopian tubes in the operating room. Very, 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 very rarely because, let's see, a fallopian tube is basically the thickness of a strand of hair. It's very hard to unblock that. Imagine taking gum and putting it into the diameter of something that's a strand of hair and then trying to take it out surgically. It's almost impossible, if not impossible. The results of each cycle, three out of four cycles produced one PGS normal embryo, three failed frozen embryo transfers with one embryo transferred each time. I had a saline sonogram and the diagnosis of my uterus was normal. My doctor gave me treatment for endometritis empirically and also a prescription for letrozole, flagell, and doxycycline. I also tried acupuncture. Plan is now to do an ERA with Receptiva DX. My doctor suspects undiagnosed endometriosis, endometritis. Why wasn't this ruled out prior? Four years and the root of my problem is unclear. Repeated cycles and losses with only one embryo left. What do you recommend for next steps? When should someone with repeated failed FET consider a gestational carrier? Okay, so Mandy, here's the deal. You got one embryo left. Before you start doing all this stuff, I would strongly recommend making more embryos if you can. Your AMH was 1.6 in 2018 there's still a chance that you can have normal embryos there and you can do another cycle. So see if you can do that. Do that now before you start down this path of surgery and you know potentially even depo Lupron. But my advice is do more embryo creation, number one. Number two, you can do an implantation cycle or dummy cycle. And on the day of the biopsy, rather than coming to the office, you can see if your doctor will coordinate a hysteroscopy, laparoscopy at the same time. So it's kind of like a threefer, right? You get the biopsy done, they look inside your lining, they then do a laparoscopy, look from outside, see endometriosis and treat it and remove your fallopian tubes and get them out of the picture because um, that might be helpful. You can also be tested for endometritis at the same time. With only one embryo left, one chance for you to have a baby with your own eggs my bias is to consider a gestational carrier if there's severe adenomyosis, for example, if there's lots of endometriosis like stage four and we don't feel, or especially with the adenomyosis and we don't feel like taking depo Lupron, you know, for months would be that helpful. But as long as let's say you have mild adenomyosis, as long as the endometriosis can be removed, the fallopian tubes can be removed, and you can respond well to depo lupron. When I mean by well, I mean you can tolerate the side effects. You could still consider transferring to yourself. But I can tell you, it feels so much better. And I know other people out there would, would agree with me. It feels so much better to go into a transfer knowing that you have an embryo waiting for you. You have other embryos there. So before you use that last one, I do think that it makes perfect sense at the age of 41 to consider using a gestational carrier. And if you can make embryos now, that's the best thing that I think you could do first. And then I'm so sorry that it took so long and so many years for you finally to get to the point where you have the final diagnosis. So for me, if I were to look at a case like yours, I would be like, tubes are blocked. Why? Endometriosis. Endometriosis blocks tubes all the time. I think a lot of times when people Google like block tubes, the first thing that comes up is gonorrhea, chlamydia. And the answer is a lot of the time, endometriosis, darn endometriosis. Okay, 
Next question is from Kim. Kim says, do you recommend baby aspirin for frozen transfers? When do you tell patients to start and stop? Do you recommend it to everyone or only certain cases? If so, which cases? There's so many different opinions on this. I would love to know your thoughts. Thank you in advance. So I'm so glad, Kim, that you mentioned your thoughts. Because again, you guys, I said this earlier on the show that this is for educational purposes only, not to replace advice from your personal physician. Just because I say something here doesn't mean that your doctor agrees or you should listen to what I say. But I'll tell you what I do. Here's the deal. I give aspirin to everyone who's doing a frozen embryo transfer, unless you have an allergy or you have severe, severe GERD. So that's um, reflux. The reason is high dose estrogen can potentially cause a blood clot. And we also know that aspirin can reduce that risk. We also know that aspirin can reduce risk of preeclampsia and maybe even preterm labor. And women who have a BMI over 30, studies have shown if you take it through the third trimester, it can, and because women with a BMI over 30 have a higher risk of preeclampsia, so it can uh, reduce that risk. We also know that women who are over 40 have an increased risk of preeclampsia, so I give everyone aspirin even after 10 weeks of pregnancy through the third trimester. People who, have, who are pregnant with more than one baby also are at increased risk of preeclampsia, so we give them aspirin through their third trimester. So I just told you basically that I give it to everybody. I stop it at 10 weeks unless you have one of those things in the little box that I check off that be like, yep, you have to take it through the third trimester. Um, some doctors, after they see me, once the patient graduates from, graduates from my office and they get seen by the OB-GYN, sometimes they actually even double or triple their dose of the aspirin based on their body size and how many babies they have if it's one or two. So the answer is yes, I recommend it to everybody. Next question is Katie from Vegas. Hi, Katie from Vegas. You just turned 36 this month. Happy birthday. I started IVF in 2019 and we're using donor sperm because we have male factor. I had a retrieval right when I turned 35. Here's the deal. I had 20 eggs, 14 mature, 12 fertilized, nine embryos. That's pretty good. I was told at the time, no need for testing. First frozen embryo transfer, 5AA, failed to implant. I took estrogen, PIO, four days of prednisone and aspirin. I had an ERA which showed 133 hours of progesterone, no signs of endometriosis or endometritis, showed fragments of a polyp. I had a hysteroscopy and it was removed. Second frozen embryo transfer, 5AA, didn't implant, same protocol. Third transfer, I transferred two, a 5AA and a 4AA, both miscarried, five weeks, three days, same protocol, ended up with a DNC. Fourth transfer, switch doctors, I transferred a 4AA, miscarriage the same day we heard a heartbeat last week. I was on estradiol, progesterone and oil, and suppositories BID. Any thought as to why I can't get past the five or six week mark? I have hypothyroidism, TSH of 0.16. I'm on levothyroxine 100 micrograms. I've had one DNC, two hysteroscopies, HSG, SIS, and no issues. Thank you for your time. So Katie, when I see a story like this, I'm thinking, have we missed antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? Have you done an autoimmune workup? Have you looked at all the thrombophilia? So that's one question I have for you. Number two, I think a hysteroscopy could be really, really helpful. Even though you've had an HSG, duh, you told me you had two hysteroscopies. Hello, Amy. So I would ask your doctor, have you really looked closely at my cavity? Have you ruled out a uterine septum for me? I know you did two hysteroscopies, but were you looking for a septum? And can you just tell me convincingly that you do not have a septum, Katie. The other thing is looking at your uterus for signs of adenomyosis. So I know you said that your doctor, it looks like, ruled out endometriosis, and it sounds like they did that maybe by doing the Receptiva DX test. So I'm wondering if there might be an aspect of adenomyosis, and that's why this is happening. And at the end of the day, when I started my practice, I'll tell you a story. I used to have patients come to me with these, with these questions, and they're like, they would say to me, is there a chance that I could be allergic to my husband, I'd be like, no way. There's no such thing as being allergic to your husband. Like, ugh, that's not a thing. And then over time, we've learned about these genes that are basically compatibility genes. And I'm not talking about the recessive genes that we check, but I feel like sometimes you just happen to fall in love with someone that you actually might be genetically incompatible with. And you're like, what, what does that even mean, Amy? Well, I'm talking about genes that are called the HLA Kerr genes, K-I-R. And there are studies looking at HLA genes of embryos related to the KIR status of the uterus. And you just kind of look at the, how they all kind of interact with one another. So it's possible that we have these, this mismatch. 
between the egg and the sperm and how that fits as an embryo, and then with the uterus and how that fits in. So it's like the embryo fits in up until a certain point and then it just can't continue to grow. And if you're just like, what is she talking about? Don't worry, it is confusing. But ask your doctor if it would make sense, and if you were a patient of mine, I would screen you for it, the HLA KR genes to see what's going on. Because if there is a situation where you guys are, you know, genetically in a situation where you have a much higher risk of miscarriage, and you should be thinking about maybe other options. And what I mean by other options, I'm thinking about using a different uterus. But believe it or not, it could be a situation where you picked, and I know you said you're using a sperm donor and just don't shoot me right now. I know you're not you're in love with your husband and not the sperm donor, but you could have just picked a sperm donor that you're just not compatible with. So there is a way to do HLA testing on a sperm donor. You have to reach out to the sperm bank and ask them to test your donor. I've done this all before. There's nothing that I haven't done or asked, and this is something that I've done. But I think first look at the most obvious things, and the most obvious things would be the stuff that I already mentioned, like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Talk to your doctor about using Lovenox empirically and um, ask them, have you ruled out adenomyosis or uterine septum? And then maybe perhaps next time do another cycle and um, consider using a different sperm donor this time. So those are the kinds of things that I would think about in a case like, a case like yours. So this next question comes from Ashley, and Ashley is saying, my husband and I are both 36, and we have four boys. That's a lot of balls in your house. <laughs> we miscarried, lots of balls, just lots of them. Um, we miscarried in January of 2020, and I'm sorry, Ashley, that happened to you. We've been trying to conceive a rainbow baby off and on for about a year now. My OB seems to think we need a fertility specialist and to jump straight to IVF because we... We're also trying to balance our family too. We, we want a girl. I'm scared to do that because I'm convinced my husband only makes male sperm. Are the odds that we don't, what are the odds that we don't get a healthy girl embryo? He himself is one of four boys. So actually I've had cases like this and I feel like everyone has the right to live the life that they want and you can use the power of technology to help you have a girl if that's what you want. But I think it's really important because you're a mom of four boys and I imagine you love every single boy. What would you do if you had a whole bunch of boy embryos that you weren't going to use? So if you guys didn't watch my GMA episode, I was on GMA for like two seconds. And I can tell you my mom watched and she said to me, Amy, next time smile. Isn't that cute? So anyways, it was a wonderful story. <laughs> oh my God, I totally digress here. Um, of embryo donation. So this woman created 17 embryos and then she donated them to two of her friends. So when someone is going through IVF to have a girl and you're so lucky to be able to do that and you have so many eggs and it sounds like you do, I wonder, have you thought through what would you do with extra unused embryos? Because that's something that's really important to think about. Would you consider donating them to other people? And if the answer is yes, I would say go for it. If the answer is no, that you want to discard them, really think about how that's going to make you feel. And if you're like, I would discard them. I don't know that I would discard them. If it makes you uncomfortable, then maybe wait five years before you discard them. But it's a conversation that you guys should have before you go through IVF. And that's a conversation that I have with everyone, especially people who have lots of embryos. And then you have to also ask, how many cycles am I going to go through to help me reach this goal? I have done, I think I've done maybe four or five IVF cycles for someone who really wanted a girl. I have, literally. Um, and sometimes it happens on the second cycle, the third cycle, sometimes even the fourth cycle. So you have to ask at what point are you going to stop? That's important to do. And then also know that sometimes you can have a girl embryo, but it might not have normal chromosomes. And I've had people say to me, like, how come you made my girl embryo have abnormal chromosomes? And I'm like, I'm not God. <laughs> like, I didn't do that. So you know, I have my checklist for patients who are doing IVF for um, gender balancing that I review with them ahead of time. So no one thinks that I have control as far as which sperm cell will be wearing pink that day and which one will be blue. And I just tell the guys, I'm like, you got to wear pink every day. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. No, I really don't say that because that's just really not a thing. There's really nothing that you can do. You can't spin the sperm a certain way to get the girls swimmers out. This next question comes from Andrea, and Andrea says, Hi, Dr. Amy. I'm 34 with an AMH of 0.2. My FSH is between, between 8 and 14. Just went for my baseline appointment thinking I was starting my first cycle tomorrow, 
and my AFC showed no follicles on day one of my cycle. I've been taking four milligrams of estrogen per day for five days. My previous follicle counts within the last six months have showed around five to six follicles. I know I ovulated last month. I ruled out Fragile X, antithyroid, anti-adrenal, anti-ovarian antibodies. I've had a chromosomal analysis, no lifestyle factor issues, and take all the quality supplements that you recommend. My mom was 55 when she went into menopause. My periods have been around 22 days the last few months. What on earth could be causing me to have such low reserve at 34? Could it be silent endometriosis? I have pretty bad period cramps, but nothing else and no family history. I just don't get it. Thank you for all you do. So Andrea, ask your dad, when did you go into menopause? I'm just kidding. You can't. That's the hard part. It could come from your dad's side of the family. Isn't that frustrating? I wish there was a gene test that was available to us. And there are companies out there that have come out with it and then they didn't get research funding to continue with the test. And it's like, oh, these are just startups. But there was a test out there called Fertile Ohm. Fertile and then OME, like fertility genome. Oh my God, that test was amazing. And if I had that test, I would do it on you, Andrea, right now, because I swear we would find out exactly what the answer is, right? Because the answer is in your genes. And I wish I could know, K-N-O-W, your genes, so that I can give you a piece of paper that says, this is why. It sounds like you ruled out all the stuff that I always talk about. And the answer is yes, it could be from endometriosis. But I also want you to know that when you're on estrays, some people are a little bit more sensitive to it than others. And some people will get suppression of their ovaries right away, even with just five days of estrogen. So over here on my left, you guys can't see it. I got a picture of a beach in Hawaii. I don't go anywhere. Who am I kidding? I got a picture of some surfboards there. I haven't surfed since I was probably 16 years old. And I got another picture of somewhere in Hawaii. I didn't take the picture. The reason why I tell you that is I'm here surfing waves all day long and those are waves of eggs. So I wouldn't despair, Andrea. I would just keep watching for it. I already mentioned to you guys my approach. Go back in in two weeks and see what's going on. Talk to your doctor about mid-luteal phase stimulation and duostim. I love both approaches and I think that they can work well in patients just like you. So see if your doctor agrees. Consider adding HGH if you're not on it already. Take all the egg quality supplements that I talk about all the time, and I hope you kick butt when you're surfing this next wave, okay? This next question and last one is from Rebecca. Rebecca says, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 26. My husband's 29. We just had our first IUI done. The sperm count was 2.8 million post-wash with 77% motility. Should we try again or move on to IVF? So Rebecca, here's the deal. You still have a good chance of being successful because the sperm motility is really high. However, at that total modal count, we're talking about 5% or less chance of IUI success. So let's figure out why is the sperm like that? Are we missing a varicocele? Are we missing a low testosterone? Are we missing some sort of, you know, diabetes? Is he on a medication that's causing it? I mean, do you just start testosterone at the gym because some guy thought it was a good idea to give him a shot in the butt? I've seen that before. There really isn't anything I haven't seen. I'm like, don't take it in the butt. Sorry, cracking myself up over here. But you guys know my thing. Where's the book? It's always nice to have eggs on ice. And this is the book that I'm plugging for my dear friend, Dr. Julie Lamb. But it's also nice to always have sperm on ice. So no matter what's going on, if you guys get pregnant in this IUI, capture that sperm, because that's good stuff. Because you might end up needing IVF in the future, and who knows what's gonna happen with this sperm. So if you're so lucky to get pregnant in this IUI, book them for a sperm freeze. If only women could ejaculate eggs. You guys, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice if girls could? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't know where that came from. So guys, I know I'm acting very chipper tonight. And it's because I got all this stuff on my mind. I got a whole bunch of triggers that I have to review with people. I love you all. I'm not going to have a chance to go through your live chatted questions tonight. But I should be able to tomorrow night. I'll be here Thursday night. I'll be here Friday night. I can't wait to see you guys again. So I hope you guys have a great, great night. Thank you guys for joining me on Ask the Egg Whisperer. I promise I'll stay and answer your live chatted questions, but I have like four procedures on Thursday. I do all my own calls. I'm gonna review instructions and make sure everyone's got it right. And there are no medical errors. I have a zero medical error tolerance rate. Like I don't tolerate it. So talk to you guys later. Have a wonderful night and keep sparkling. Love you guys.